This week you'll be doing your first at-home lab on chemical modeling. One of the things that's so challenging about chemistry is that the atoms and molecules we're discussing are so small, we can't see them with the naked eye. That's why making models can be so helpful. In lab exercise A, our first activity is to construct molecules of water and salt. And in this way, we'll be able to visualize much better how water and salt are going to behave in living cells. So as you work on this activity, remember that the water in your body and the salt in your body, in your cells, in your bloodstream, in the cells of all living organisms are interacting in the way that we'll model. The items that you'll need for activity one include your collected items to construct your models, a clear flat space to lay out your models, and you'll probably also want to keep a camera or a cell phone handy because you'll need to be taking pictures along the way. Those pictures are going to end up in a PowerPoint presentation that you'll submit at the end of the lab. That PowerPoint presentation and how to deal with the images and put that together is something that I'll address in a separate video. Sometimes you're going to need to take selfies, you and your molecules. Other times you'll need to take pictures of just the model that you're looking at. So make sure that you read the instructions carefully. Let me say a few words about taking pictures before we actually get into our models. Since you're going to be embedding these pictures in a PowerPoint presentation, it's important that the file size of your picture is small. Therefore, you don't need to take pictures in HDR or high definition. And when you're downloading and moving pictures around, make sure you just pick the normal resolution or email sharing setting. You don't need to have the highest quality images. They'll make your files too big and the PowerPoint presentation will also have too big of a file type. So just keep that in mind. And if you have any questions about how to adjust those settings on your camera or on your phone, you can Google that or you can ask me. All right, the first thing that we need to do in activity one is, con is to construct a water molecule. I hope at this point we remember the st structure of a water molecule based on our earlier discussion. And that is for every water molecule, we have one oxygen and two hydrogens. I have some boring styrofoam balls here that I'm going to use, but when you construct your models, I want you to be creative as you like. You might find things around your home that you could use. Uh, you can make your models really large. You can make them really small. I'll let you decide what you would like to do. Some people will use food like grapes and apples or oranges and grapefruits. Other people might use buttons that they might have around the house. You might have uh, various things in your kids' bedrooms, uh, under the seat of your car, whatever you can find is something that you could use. And I'll show you a few examples of some in a few minutes. In constructing our first water molecule then, we need to pick items that are going to be of the right size, relatively speaking. Our single oxygen molecule is going to be larger than our hydrogen, and so we need to make sure that we have two smaller items that are going to represent our hydrogen and one slightly larger that's going to represent our oxygen. It's also important when we put them together that we arrange them the way that we've talked about them in the past. So there's a couple of ways that you could do this. You could make a model using toothpicks where we take our oxygen and we add our hydrogen to it. And then we could add the other hydrogen on the other side, and we'll add that there. It's important when we make our first water molecule that our hydrogens are arranged here at an angle, and they're not sticking out to the side. That's an important characteristic of our water molecule. We also can see that the material that we're using to connect these two things are representing the kind of bond that's there. So I hope we remember that this is a polar covalent bond, making the molecule of water a polar molecule. You'll be labeling these in the PowerPoint presentation. So once you have your model made, uh, then you can simply snap a picture of that, and you'll want to make sure you do that up close with your phone or with your camera. Incidentally, before you get started with all of this, you'll want to take a picture, a selfie, of you with all of your materials. You'll need to make sure that your face is in the presentation. The next thing that you'll need to do is actually construct three or more molecules of these. So feel free to construct your molecule, molecules as we go, or you can simply follow along as I complete them here. Other materials that you could use would be pipe cleaners. Pipe cleaners are great ways for scientists to model things, and we'll actually use them a fair amount this semester. You can see here that I've made five molecules of water and arranged them on my flat space. 
you want to make sure that they're in the actual orientation in which they would behave if they were actually inside of a cell or a lake or a puddle or inside the water that you might drink. So it's important to remember where our charges are on a water molecule. I hope we remember that our oxygen is negatively charged and our hydrogens are positively charged. So when I take this one water molecule and I set it down next to another, I want to make sure that I arrange it so that the oxygen of one and the hydrogen of another are close by to one another. And then, as I arrange them, we'll do more of the same. We we'll want to be sure that these water molecules are arranged so that their charges are going to attract. Opposite charges attract, negative and positive. There's an infinite number of ways that you could arrange your molecules to be able to show those, and this is something that you'll label in the PowerPoint presentation. Once you have your many water molecules arranged, then you'll want to snap another picture and make sure that we eventually get that to the PowerPoint presentation. You'll want to hang on to these water molecules, but one more thing we need to do in Activity 1 is to model salt. I have some slightly larger styrofoam balls to model um, putting together sodium and chloride. It's important that we remember which molecule is larger. So if you remember back to the structure of sodium and chloride, chloride has more protons and electrons than sodium does. So I picked the larger one to represent chloride and the smaller one to represent our sodium. Um, you can put these together uh, with whatever type of um, materials that you have. Remember though that this is going to represent a different kind of bond. In our water molecule, we had a bond that's called a polar covalent bond holding together our oxygen and our hydrogen. However, here when we join together sodium and chloride, the bond that's going to join them is going to be an ionic bond. So you may want to consider that when you're thinking about putting these materials together. It's also helpful to have separate sodium and chloride atoms and to arrange those not connected in a bond. I hope we remember when they're not connected in a bond, they actually represent ions, charged atoms. Uh, our chloride is negatively charged and our sodium is positively charged and that's something that we'll need to include in our image. So you may want to have two aspects of sodium and chloride, one together in an ionic bond and then sodium and chloride separated as two different atoms representing the ions that we have. And again, you'll want to make sure that you snap a picture of these to include in your PowerPoint. You'll want to be sure that you save all of these models. We'll be using them again in Activity 2. We're now ready to move on to Activity 2 in Lab Exercise A. Now that we've modeled water and salt, it's time for us to take a look at how some of the characteristics of our atoms put together as molecules actually matters for the properties of water. The word properties just means characteristics. So how does water behave when we actually can see it with the naked eye? Remember, whenever we're looking at water with the naked eye, we're seeing many, many, many molecules of water and their interactions. I wanted to go over some of the equipment that you'll need for this next part of our lab. You'll notice in your course manual, you have a few things that you need to get from the uh, Carolina Biological Supply House lab kit that you've ordered. One of those is a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. You actually receive two graduated cylinders, and you'll notice you have a small one and a large one. Today we're going to use the large one, and you'll know that this is a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder because it says 100 at the top. This one, the 25 milliliter, is something that we'll use in other laboratories. So we'll put this one aside, and we'll keep out the 100 for today. We're also going to need a beaker, and that's going to be your 250 milliliter beaker. And again, you'll see 250 mils that says it here at the very top. And we're going to be mixing some solutions in this today. You'll also need a dropping pipette. Uh, dropping pipette, uh, you should have many of these uh, grouped together, and we're just going to use one of them now. After we do this today, then hang on to this. This is something that we can reuse because we're simply going to be putting water in it. So we'll put this off to the side as well. There are some additional things that you'll need for today's lab. Things that I hope that you already have around your house or things that you could buy very easily, uh, very cheaply at the grocery store. Let's take a look. First of all, if you have any table salts, uh, you can use a salt shaker. Uh, we're going to be using a whole tablespoon, so if you had some more, that would be great. We'll hang on to those. Uh, also, we'll need some table sugar. 
we won't be using nearly this much. So if you just have a sugar bowl at home, whatever you have in that will be plenty to use. You'll need some dish soap. And this is just the stuff that's hanging out by your sink. This happens to be Dawn. Any single type that you use is going to work just fine. You'll also need some water. You can just put water in a glass or have access to your uh, sink. Uh, I just put some water here in a beaker, uh, but you can put it in a glass and just have that around. Just basic tap water. Some other things that we'll need are going to be some squares of paper. If you just have a piece of office paper. So this is the kind of paper that would go through your printer. Uh, it's important that it's paper that would slide past. So not notebook paper, but office paper. Uh, probably if you had anything printed off at the print shop, uh, or if you uh, have any book that's a little bit glossy, then uh, maybe a page out of a textbook would work well too. Maybe go to the back and snip out a square. It's okay if it has writing on it. So we'll need a square of it. We'll also need a square of wax paper, and so here is a square of wax paper. If you don't have wax paper at home, you could actually just substitute in a Ziploc bag, so uh, just cutting out a square of it to use. We need something that's made of plastic or waxy. And then finally, you'll need a square of a paper towel. Uh, whatever paper towel or napkin that you have at your home will work just fine. You'll also need a penny, so uh, we'll be using that here as well. And then finally, a couple of ways to make some measurements that you might have at home would be a tablespoon and a teaspoon. In the laboratory uh, at school uh, or in real scientific laboratories, we oftentimes will measure things by weight or mass. And in that case, we need to have a balance to be able to measure those things out. If you happen to have one at your home and you want to use that, that's fine too. But I know most of us don't, but uh, we can measure things uh, pretty well with the things that you have at your house. So that's one difference between what we might see in a science laboratory versus what you might be doing at home. The first thing that we want to do in steps number 9 and 10 is to make some measurements of water, mix it with salts to make a solution. So you'll notice in step 9 that we need to use our graduated cylinder and measure out 50 milliliters of water into the 250 milliliter beaker. We want to make sure that we get to 50 milliliters. And what you'll notice as you start to put water into your graduated cylinder is that, and let's pour in some water, and let's pour it well below the 50. One of the things that you'll notice if you get all the air bubbles out is that water isn't necessarily straight across. It actually is higher on the sides, lower in the bottom, and higher on the other side. So you'll want to look at this really closely. And the thing that you want to do is pour in your water so that the bottom of the bubble uh, or the bottom of the water, what we call the meniscus, is actually right at the 50 line. So the edges that go up a little higher will go up a little bit above 50. You'll also want to make sure that your graduated cylinder is flat on the side of your counter and you'll add your water and you'll look at it from the side and you want to make sure that you get as close to 50 as you can and then double check that that meniscus is right at 50. So once you're very clear that you have 50 milliliters of water, you'll pour that into your 250 mil beaker. And so we can put that graduated cylinder off to the side and our water off to the side. The next thing that we're going to add to this is going to be salt. We're going to add about 17 grams of salt. That's roughly equal to one tablespoon. So I'm going to take our salt and we will pour it into our tablespoon. And we'll want to make sure we don't get too much. You want to make your measurements as accurately as possible. That's a little domed up, so I want to flatten it out a little bit. And I spilled a little salt on my counter, so keep that in mind. And there we go. We're about equal now. And I'm going to pour this into our beaker. You'll need to stir this next. If you want to just use your tablespoon, you can. If you want to use a knife or another spoon that you have, that's fine as well. And you'll just want to stir this for a few minutes. And what we're really looking at here is to see whether or not the salt is dissolving in the water. As we do this, you might want to make some observations about what's happening. You'll notice maybe then that some of the salt is going to dissolve and some of it isn't going to dissolve. 
And so that's an important observation that you'll want to make. One of the things that you can do is play around a little bit with temperature. If you used warmer water, then you might find that it does dissolve a lot faster. Um, you could sit here and stir and stir and stir and potentially get it all to dissolve, and that might be a good goal. If you use really cold water, you might find that you wouldn't be able to dissolve any of it at all. So I just want you to make some observations about what's happening when we put that salt into the water. Surely this is something that you do all the time, but now we want to think about what's actually happening on a molecular level. I hope that you saw that as you continued to stir, more and more of the salt did dissolve. But maybe not all of it. It's possible that you still have some salt that's at the bottom of your beaker. And that means that some of it has dissolved and some of it hasn't. If we added more water, we could probably get the rest of it to dissolve. What I want to do in steps 11 and 12 is to talk about what's happening inside of this beaker at a molecular level. And for that, we want to get the models back out that you've already used in the activity one of lab exercise A. We remember that we had salt, and I've labeled them here as our chloride and our Na, our sodium, held together in an ionic bond. And this is what salt looks like when it's in your salt shaker and when you put it on your food. However, whenever we have salt mixing with water, we know that this ionic bond is going to break. And that means that sodium is now going to be by itself as an ion. So what kind of ion is this? An anion or a cation? How about chloride? When it separates from sodium, it's also going to be an ion. What kind? You'll want to review what the charges on each of these are. Are they positive? Are they negative? Which one's positive? Which one's negative? That means then, if they are functioning as independent ions, and we start to bring water molecules around them, like you did when you added the salt to the beaker, the water molecules are going to start to arrange themselves around these ions in very specific ways based on the charges of these particular atoms and the charges that we have on the polar molecules of water. So let me go through one example with you, and then I'll let you do the other ion on your own. Let's just take a look at sodium. Sodium, because of the fact that it loses an electron to chloride, is going to become a positively charged ion, which is called a cation. And that cation, then, is going to have this positive charge such that when it comes in contact with a water molecule, is this positive charge going to be attracted to the negative charges on oxygen or the positive charges on our hydrogens? I hope we remember that opposite charges will attract. So if we have sodium that is positively charged and a water molecule comes by, it's going to orient itself so that the oxygen is going to sit closer to the sodium. This will be true for a number of water molecules we can have a number of water molecules surrounding our positively charged sodium cation. And we should arrange the water molecules so that our negatively charged portion of our water molecule is sitting closest to it. You'll want to make sure that you take a picture of this, and then you'll need to do something similar with chloride. You'll need to determine its charge, and if we take water molecules and surround it, then how will the water molecules be arranged? That's what you'll need to do in steps 11 and 12. You'll need to take pictures, upload those pictures, put them in your PowerPoint, and label them there. The next thing that we'll do to explore some of the properties of water are in steps 13, 14, and 15. This is where we're going to utilize those three pieces of paper we talked about earlier. This is our square of office paper. This is our wax paper or a piece of a Ziploc bag. And then finally, we have our paper towel. What you'll need to do is use the dropping pipette. You want to get just some plain water, so the stash of water we had before just out of your tap. And you want to place a single drop of water on each of the three squares. Before you do that, you'll want to be ready with a timer. I usually just set one on my phone or take a look at your watch. And you'll want to wait exactly one minute and observe what's happening over the course of that minute. So I'm going to put one drop here on our office paper on our wax paper and on the paper towel. 
and we'll wait and watch that for one minute. Some of the things that you'll want to be looking at as you make those observations is what happens to your water drop. Is it soaking in? Is it not soaking in? Is it soaking in really quickly? Is it soaking in a little bit more slowly? And then if it's not soaking in, what is the integrity of the water molecule look like? Uh, is it beating up or is it just making sort of a flat surface? In your own words, you'll need to describe in step number 15 what has happened with each of these papers. And then you'll also need to offer some explanation for why these three papers behave so differently when you add just a plain drop of water to each of them. The next experiment that you'll do will involve the penny that we set aside earlier, as well as a dropper that has some water in it, just plain water from the tap. What you'll need to do starting in step 17 is to clean off and dry your penny. That's important, especially if it's been uh, dirty under your car seat or something like that. And you'll want to start to add water drop by drop. You'll need to count these drops as you go, and your goal is to make a dome on top of the penny without overflowing it. And so you'll need to add as many drops as you can to keep going to see how many you can get on that. And you'll record that in step number 18. After you've determined that number, the next thing that you'll want to do, picking up in step number 21, is to dry off your penny, and then this is where you'll use your detergent you will want to take just one small drop of detergent and you're gonna rub it over the top of your penny. And then you'll do the exact same thing. You're going to add water drop by drop to try to attempt the same thing, to see if you can make a dome of water without overflowing your penny. And you'll want to count how many drops you added until that occurred. After both of these trials, you'll want to take a picture and also be able to describe what happened and any potential differences uh, between the two and an explanation for them. It has you in your course manual sketch your penny after each of these scenarios. And one of the things that you might want to do, again, is not only sketch it from the top, but to actually look at the side, uh, to look at the side of your penny and to be able to see how it domes up in the first scenario and then what happens in the second scenario. That can give you an idea of height that you can't really see when you look straight down. For the next experiment in number 25, you'll want to clean out your beaker. Remember that it had the salt water solution in it. We're done with that now. And we actually want to make another solution. So as you follow the instructions in number 25, what you'll need to do is again, measure out 50 mils of water and put that in the beaker, just the way that we talked about before. And then you'll want to add one gram of sucrose. Remember, sucrose is going to be our table sugar. So we're going to get out one teaspoon of this table sugar, and we're going to add it to our beaker, and we are going to stir to determine what happened. You want to attempt to dissolve this to see if it dissolves. Again, you want to stir for a bit of time. And you may find that some of it dissolves, but not all of it. What I'd like you to think about is as you're stirring, uh, what's occurring between the molecules of our sugar and the molecules of water. We might know, not know the complete structure of sugar yet, but you can at least make some predictions about the polarity, what our solute is, and what our solvent is. The last experiment that we'll do is question number 26. You'll need to have cleaned out your 250 milliliter beaker, and you'll want to, like we have before, measure out 50 milliliters of water. You'll want to pour that in your beaker. And here we're going to use an oil to mix with our water. This happens to be just plain vegetable oil, but if you have olive oil or any other kind of oil at your house, you actually could use that as well. We're going to use two tablespoons, and so you can measure this out as accurately as you can. So we want to add that in. There's one. There's two. It's okay if you get a little extra or don't quite put in all of the two tablespoons. And we'll put that to the side and then we'll stir. And what you want to observe is whether or not these two things are dissolving together. You might want to try to stir pretty aggressively to see if you can get them to mix. And then once you've stirred, you can set this off to the side and make some observations about what's occurring. 
Again, you'll want to look from the top, but you'll also want to take a look at the side and to notice what's occurring between your water and your oil and what happened when you stirred and attempted to dissolve our oil into our water.